tell me more there. So if there isn't a metric or maybe it's early or maybe, you know, the, the client, the, the, the numbers are sensitive, you know, yeah. if it could be anything related to security or PII or anything like that, com- customers may not want to disclose that. So, yeah. so tell me more about case studies that don't have a metric in them. Because to me, that seems like, no, no, it's got to have a number. Yeah. I mean, let's let's take the example of cybersecurity, right? Um, how do you write a metrics-based story about a breach that didn't happen? How, how do you write a metrics-based story ab- about something on, on the security side at all? I mean, sometimes there are numbers you can bring in, like X number of accounts protected or things, but those are rarely the core story. The, the real story is often in how much more quickly threats can you know, be detected or in how much you know, how, how much more confident the company can scale or operate in this arena or how much work has been taken off of their plate. But there's not often, you know, a quantifiable way of putting that. Uh, when we're thinking about, okay, there's no metric in the story. How do we make this valuable? I think what you want to reflect on, take it back to the beginning and sales people are very good at this and understand the pain state, understand, you know, what, what is the most acute pain that leads someone to seek you out when they imagine their final state what does that look like for them? And sometimes, you know, with an implementation, yes, you know, the, the most obvious metrics, for example, going to be was it on time, was it on budget, that type of thing. But there's a huge component to that story, which is the lack of hassle or the smoothness of the implementation or the way that they feel heard and supported throughout. There's this very experiential side of those stories where did we feel looked after? And so when you're looking at stories without any metrics, focus in on the, where did they start their journey? What was the most acute pain and how was that alleviated? And how can you demonstrate the alleviation of that pain? That is where hero quotes can be really strong. That is where uh, having, and, and that's why I, I will never advise doing a case study without interviewing the customer because you can never get these components without it. Um, mm-hmm. But Uh, That is where a quote about the experience, that is a quote about your relationship, that is where some of these squishier, more qualitative things can come to light. I think also think through when you talk with people on sales calls, when you you think about the end state, how do people describe that and how can you take that language and now describe this in the story, Um, you know, bringing those more qualitative aspects out. Uh, One of the worst things you can do with a case study is kitchen sink it, bring every every positive metric, every positive outcome, try to sweep them all into one story. Like, look at all the good stuff we did. The problem is that appeals to nobody. It's meant to appeal to everyone. It appeals to no one because there's no focused narrative arc. So start with a clear pain, walk through that transformative journey, show the alleviation of that pain because we don't all buy because we have some metric in mind we want to satisfy. There's an end state we want to achieve, a pain we want to be rid of. How can you communicate that in the story? I think in the absence of a metric, there's still plenty of leverage, whether it's quotes or descriptions of the relationship or descriptions of what's now possible for them that that can cross that off the list and still be very, very appealing. I love that. I, I hadn't, and this is, I hadn't considered that because you, you to your point, you know, if a company, I'm, I'm thinking about this through the lens of somebody hiring PR, you know, they can see the case studies. They can see the results. There probably isn't anything on the case in the case studies that are like the thing that we hear all the time is like, "Oh, your team's great to work with. They were they made it super easy." And there's nothing in our case studies. They're like, "Oh yeah, you know, just we an incredible person. We just love talking to her. You know, even when things were going bad, she was incredible. Like, you know, those kinds of things." even for like a customer who maybe didn't get the results where it was like, Hey, this actually, you know, the, it didn't work, but the team was amazing. Like, have you ever done case studies like that? Uh, I I think, so we haven't done a case study necessarily on a situation that didn't entirely pan out, but we have done case studies on, you know, where there is no quantifiable metric ever to be had. I mean, when you, when you look at the story of the air filtration in the gym, um, you know, the, how how do you numerically, oh, okay, well, more people came to the gym. That's not a meaningful outcome. The most valuable thing we can do in that results section is speak to the owners feeling confident that, that they're providing this. And, and more importantly, their customers, we might bring in their perspective and talk about, this is why I chose this gym. This is, you know, I, I feel safe coming in here. It, it, there is no, you know, 
So we haven't done a story where like things haven't necessarily panned out, but what we have done and what can be enormously valuable is showing a pivot, showing where not the whole story didn't work out, but the initial direction, oh, there was a snag. And there's a lot of fear around including this because, oh, if we make it look like the engagement wasn't perfect, people are going to think, oh, they made mistakes all the way. The reality is people know and understand any complex engagement of any kind things are going to go wrong. Adjustments are going to need to be made. And especially this is where we come to that solution section. This is a chance to show your thinking, your relationship building, your adaptability, your flexibility on display. In my view, it's okay to say, we did this. We recognize this needed to pivot or the circumstances in the market changed or the circumstances for the company changed. And here's how we adjusted. And now they got this great outcome. But it's a it's a hard sell because a lot of companies are so worried about not presenting as perfect that they lose the opportunity to show their adaptability, flexibility, thinking process, and all that there. So I think you still want the story to be net positive in the end, but I think it's very okay to bring in these aspects of here's how we changed, here's how we adjusted. Yeah. I, I think they're the one unique, because uh, I was thinking through the lens of PR. And as I said that, I was like, oh, I maybe should have clarified that like companies hire us to help figure out if they can, if like outbound is going to make sense for them. Mm. And like, you can't guarantee that outbound is going to work for a uh, company. Yes. Because, you know, but we can guarantee that we will help you figure that out. And so yeah. like, I, I I wanted to add that piece of clarity because I didn't yeah, get yeah. the impression that like, oh yeah, I want to write case studies on like customers where it was terrible. And it really yeah. Sucked. <laughs> no, no, I, I tried with you. Know, I mean, in that instance, yes. I mean, the desirable end state there has been achieved. You walk them through a process, you help them recognize that something was not going to work for them or was not right for them. And moreover, you know, you probably saved them a, an incredible amount of wasted time and investment and lost opportunities on what could work. And, and having those discussions around, they were open with us, they were transparent with us, they communicated clearly, they didn't sugarcoat it. All of those things become enormously valuable in the context of that story. So yes, tracking with you now, yes, that is the kind of thing where, no, there, there may not be a, you know, OX percent metric, but the fact that you took them through that, that you were honest, I mean, every company on the planet is going to say, we have exceptional customer service, you know, we, we, we give it to you straight. That is a demonstration of that value in action. And that is a huge net positive for a case study. Got it. Got it. Cool. Thanks for the context there. And I think that's another one that's like somebody in cybersecurity or somebody in, <clears throat> I don't know, DevOps, mm -hmm. you know, you can, where the drawing the line to, you know, ROI positive is a little bit harder. You know, these are the kinds of things that, that, uh, you know, can also be good targets for case studies. If, mm -hmm. if your clients aren't, I won't let you share the, uh, the actual metrics because, mm -hmm. You know, even sometimes when we do case studies, people are like, no, I don't want to share that. Like I had one who like the customer, one of our first customers, the founder still won't add me on LinkedIn. <laughs> they won't add me on LinkedIn. He'll never tweet about us. He won't, he'll do customer interviews as long as I tell him, you know, who it is ahead of time because he's got a very large com competitor and they've got a very small, they're a very small bootstrap team. And like, they don't want their competitor to find out they have a sales development team. So none of their SDRs are on LinkedIn. Like we helped them build the first one like eight years ago. Anyway, it's a long story. Yeah. But like some people do not want to share that for very specific reasons. And these are amazing, um, amazing pieces to build case studies on if you're struggling for, you know, client won't let me share the metrics. Yeah. And so you, so if implementation, if experience, if the customer service element are some of those things that you can write case studies about, what are some of the other um, kind of elements or the other types of stories um, that we might be able to tell and like, how do we vary our customer or that interview for that case study to tell these types of stories? Like we kind of talked about switcher and disambiguate. Wow. That was a hard word to say. Disambiguation. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think when you begin with the end in mind, this is where, you know, everybody wants to Google, you know, 10 best questions for a customer interview. And, and that's, it's, it's not that there's anything wrong with that. It's a good starting point, but let's go back to what I said earlier. Your goal is to transform your customer into a storyteller. Why? Something else I said earlier, the big goal for this piece is for it to be relatable. 
You want your story to be relatable to a person in that situation, evaluating that decision, looking for that transformative end state. And that varies greatly depending on is their transformative end state to, you know, make the right call on which of the many options they're presented, then a switcher story that helps them make a decision surrounding this is why someone like me would make the decision against one company for another. That's where the level of detail you might include in a story like that. You, you might include uh, metrics from, you know, the the changeover. You, you might fixate instead of, you know, on, uh, you know, financial budget, things like that. You, you might fixate on looking at, okay, the before state and the challenges with the old tool and the after state and, and how you alleviated those. If you're talking about an implement, implementation type of story, again, I mean, either an implementation was successful or it wasn't. It was on time or it wasn't. It was within budget if it wasn't. But but what you're really looking at, implementation is stressful. It can be frenetic. There are huge emotional components and there is rarely a time in a relationship where the customer needs you to show up for them more, guide them more, build confidence more. There, your question set might fixate more around things like you know, some examples of questions we might use in a story like that. How did X company demonstrate throughout the process that they had your best interests at heart through the implementation? Or how did X company build rapport with your team beyond you? Uh, and get, can you give us an example? One of the things, uh, can you give us an example of a time where during the implementation, X team went above or beyond? Um, can you give me, you know, one of the things we've learned over time too, is rather than say, can you give me your best or what's the, the number one thing? If you want to arrive at that insight, but do so in a way that's less mentally taxing for the person you're interviewing, ask them for their top three. Because for some reason, our brains, neurolinguistically, we have an easier time compiling sets of uh, of, of two or three than, than an individual like, oh, very, very top thing. But but you might fix it more on the, you know, how did it feel to know that the implementation was being looked after? How were you kept in the loop throughout the process? You, you dig into some of these other things. If we're talking about disambiguation type of stories, very different. So there it's less about the emotional side of it and, and the stressful side of it because that's not really the story at hand. There what you try to do is drive to the heart and get very clear and succinct terms of what is the value to you, uh, you know, and, and what did your uh, purchase or, or, or your journey uh, look like here. So there uh, you might ask again very pointed questions around, um, you know, how did this, uh, can, can you give me a sense of how this worked? in your environment, or you might ask them, what objections did you have early in, in the process and how are those objections alleviated? Um, by, by focusing on something like that, you can get a sense of where there are friction points, where they may not have seen the initial value, where they might not have seen the initial fit. And then you can show within the body of the story how those things were overcome and you can counter those objections in, in the context of the story. Um, when you're doing a, a story around something like a, a playbook. So again, this is just to recap, this is where you not only show the customer success story, but you give a bit of a recipe. There's a company called Mutiny that does these beautifully, mutinyhq.com, where they have this playbook section and it's how X company got a result, but then it actually breaks out the steps of using their tools so that it's replicable. Well, there, your question said is really, you're probably going to want to prime the customer ahead of time so they can pull that, they can come prepared. There, it's a much more technical type of story. So you'll be fixating on there. You might even have them walk through during the call, a screen share and demonstrate and capture some of those things so that you're better equipped to go back and, and capture that. And it's not that those aren't also emotional stories and things like that, but there's just not as heavy an emphasis because you're trying to build a recipe. You're trying to, to build a playbook. So regardless of you know the situation, don't walk into every interview with, just the same 10 questions. You can use those as your base as you're launching off point, but take a quick beat, take five minutes to think through what kinds of open-ended questions are going to help me derive or, or drive to the, the real value, drive to the real experience of this solution, drive to the, the real context at hand here.